Welcome to IQ On, a series of programmes that delves into the aspects of the skills wheel from the Institute of Quarian. The skills wheel has been developed to give us core sections of competence for a modern extractivist manager, covering all aspects of your knowledge, from operational and technical through to soft skills including organisational and management. We're going to take a look into a key topic that affects all of us in the extractives industry, health and safety. Using the Institute of Quarian's LinkedIn page and the hashtag IQON, we're going to be able to continue the conversation to share best practice and engage with everybody throughout the Institute of Quarian network. In this programme and with the experts that we have on board for it, we're going to start to look at organisational culture and whether that can help us to manage the safety culture and drive forward. We're going to be looking at competence, communication, workforce engagement, and we're also going to consider some of the key aspects around why we do safety. Not just the moral reasons, but also legal and financial reasons. We're joined by Alan Milband of House Percival and also the editor of the Institute of Quarian Health and Safety Law and Quarries book. And also Colin Mew, Chief Inspector of Quarries for the HSE in the UK. We're also going to be talking to James Thorne, CEO of the Institute of Quarian. We're also going to be joined by Viv Russell, Managing Director at Longcliffe Group. So one of the things to do with health and safety is really just getting to the crux of why do we do health and safety? So could you just expand a little bit on why you do health and safety? You know, we've got a, a moral obligation that our workers come into work with, um, with the same number of fingers and then they go with the same number of fingers after that. Um, but also is that a good health and safety management is good business management. You know, our, our role is to make money safely and uh, to do that you're using exactly the same skills uh, um, that you would actually have to, uh, whether you're managing safety or whether you're managing a business. So in your role, have you seen some differences in how we manage health and safety in the UK compared to other countries around the world? We rightly hold our, ourselves up as, as some of the leaders globally about uh, dealing with some of the key safety issues that we, we all face and health issues. Um, but I think we can also start to learn from other parts of the world as well. There's really good practice going on in some parts of the world. And again, it's that ability to be able to share that knowledge amongst our members is really important. So building on that, how does the Institute of Aquarian help to um, benefit organisations throughout the world in terms of developing their safety performance? Last year we launched our strategy and obviously one of the key pillars with that was to be the global leader in standards uh, for, for our profession within the industry. And I think a key part of that is obviously the health and safety agenda. Uh, and so what we're striving to do as an organisation, as an institute, is to take those standards out globally and make sure that they're embedded as, in many places as possible where the quarrying industry takes place. Uh, and I think that's a key part for us, not only to set the standards, but then enable and support people to achieve those standards. So again, through education and training, but also connecting people with members to be able to share the best practice and good practice to help raise those uh, standards and, and achieve the standards that we set is, is a key part of what we should be doing. So Alan, could you give us a background as to some of the legal framework that we have to understand in terms of quarrying in the UK? Yeah, I mean it, essentially uh, there is an overarching piece of legislation, the Health and Safety at Work Act of 1974, uh, and that imposes general duties on employers and others. Uh, and all employers are subject to that, irrespective of the sector in which they operate. And then the Health and Safety at Work Act is effectively supplemented by uh, a series of regulations uh, which apply to more uh, specific circumstances, tasks and the like. Okay, so when organisations uh, look at the rules, the procedures, the policies, which regulations uh, and legislation should they be most concerned with? Yeah, well, in, in the quarrying sector, uh, what's very important is that it has to be understood that uh, the duties under the Health and Safety at Work Act are going to apply. And at risk of oversimplification, they require employers to uh, ensure that everyone, their own employees and others who might visit the premises, for example, are going to be kept safe. But fundamentally in the quarrying sector, of course, we have the 1999 quarries regulations. Uh, and those are the ones of which all uh, owners and operators in the sector need to be acutely aware. I guess we could say that we are lucky that um, for as a industry, the quarry regulations 1999 are a reasonably recent bit of legislation, although almost 20 years old or 20 years old now. Um, do you think we benefit from that? Well, 
Obviously, it is useful uh, to have a, a comprehensive set of regulations that apply specifically in the sector. They appear to have stood the test of time uh, reasonably well, uh, as a lot of health and safety lawyers, and, and particularly those with some specialism in the sector, will tell you. Uh, there's been plenty of scope for argument and interpretation over the years, but in essence, it's a solid piece uh, of legislative provision. Uh, and to that extent, it is, I'll stop short of saying gospel, um, but it is pretty close to uh, setting the compliance bar. Uh, and if you are complying as an employer and as others affected with the uh, Quarries Regulations of 1999, you're going to be there or thereabouts uh, in terms of your health and safety compliance generally. So in your view, Alan, do you think that um, legal compliance should be our only objective when we look at policies and procedures? No. Um, legal compliance effectively sets the minimum, but the difficulty is if the sole focus is on legal compliance, then you start to lack the necessary foresight, uh, to some extent the thinking outside the box that is necessary as much to foresee uh, things uh, that might occur. They go wider than compliance. These could be matters uh, that affect, for example, an organisation internally and which, if not uh, properly thought through, uh, can make it miss the compliance bar. That, uh, maybe a bit of a daft analogy, but I think one that might help those listening to this, is if you can imagine driving strictly to the rules of the road, which we are required to do and which we must do. But if we fail to bring into that equation degrees of foresight, um, degrees of experience and other things, we can still get into difficulties, even though technically we are complying with, in that instance, the rules of the road. And I think that's the same for health and safety compliance in any, employ any, in any employer's scenario. If you are not um, thinking around the issues, uh, then simple compliance will only get you so far. So if, if we move on to incidents, do you ever have organisations approaching you to see whether their, uh, their policies and procedures allow them and give them protection following an incident, uh, almost preempting it? The answer is actually yes. I get consulted by quite a lot of organisations who, with admirable foresight, want to know whether their systems and procedures are both legally compliant uh, and capable of uh, helping them avert some of the more potentially serious consequences in uh, an industry which, let's face it, is not without risk. So within the sector, Colin, we've got some massively different size operations as well as organisations. How do you think that differs with their uh, demonstration to comply and excel with regulation? Fundamentally, compliance with the law, whether you're a large organisation or a small organisation, is the same. Um, so it, it doesn't make any uh, any difference, but smaller organisations shouldn't be daunted. Um, there's, uh, there's sufficient guidance out there that actually they would need to write very little. Most of it has been written for them uh, in one form or uh, or other. You know, either in uh, the the publication of the Institute of Quarry and the the regulations themselves, or the the guidance that uh, some of the uh, the trade associations have uh, have produced, or, or the Quarry's National Joint Advisory uh, Committee has uh, produced, for example. There's plenty of guidance there um, on how to uh, to do it, um, and those uh, or that guidance material can just be lifted into uh, into an organisation and used pretty much as it's uh, as it's written now. So. I think it's widely accepted that over the last couple of years we've had a massive setback in terms of our strive for zero harm within this industry and the sector. What do you think uh, in terms of the HSE? Are we going the right direction? Are we working well? Are we heading the right way? From around about 2000 we saw significant uh, improvements. Um, Part of that, I think, uh, was because the legislative framework changed. We saw the quarries regulations come in in, uh, in 2000. Um, but over and above that, um, the, the industry stepped up to the mark in terms of it, it accepted that uh, it needed to, uh, to improve. And we, um, we had the, the quarry's hard target, which was basically to, to achieve um, a 50% reduction uh, in riddle reportable uh, injuries uh, and accidents over five years. Um, that target was met early. It was actually exceeded. So 
the target was then set for another 50% over uh, for five years. Uh, and what that delivered over, over a period of 10 years was an 85% reduction in real or reported accidents, which is tremendous. Um, so you can imagine what the graph looked like. It, it, it was... Uh, you know, it, it was a very steep decline in the uh, the numbers, but unfortunately, what we've seen since around about 2009 is that has all levelled off. What do you think the priorities over the next few years? The priorities just now? I think um, we're we're at a point where it's still the simple things, the basic issues, which are catching people out and uh, and hurting people. So. I don't think we're, we're looking at sophisticated uh, solutions. Uh, I think we're still looking at some very simple, basic uh, risks. And uh, as inspectors, we're we're focusing on um, guarding, pedestrian safety, um, isolation, competence of uh, of individuals, and then we're, we're unique in in the quarry industry that we've got. Um, two sort of high hazard but low probability um, uh, risks that we, we deal with and that is uh, the risks from uh, the use of explosives on, on site and geotechnics um, you know, and both of those have got the, the capability to, to cause multiple casualties both on site and off site so we can we can never take our eye off uh, off the ball on those, albeit you know the, the serious incidents related to those. Fortunately, are, uh, are relatively uh, rare, but we do um, we do see precursor events um, in both of those in terms of um, uh, instability of uh, faces, instability of tips, um, rock projections, and misfires, and they're all precursor events to something which could be far more serious um, and so we, you know, we, we investigate those as a matter of course. What is the Institute of Quarrying doing to help support the industry in Zero Harm? Well the Institute has a very rich heritage in, in health and safety. I think primarily that's why it was founded with people from the industry coming together to try and make improvements when they're seeing their colleagues being hurt, injured and killed at work. So that's been going on for over 100 years of our members coming together to share best practice and good practice to help develop ways of making sure that people can work effectively and efficiently but also do that in the safest possible way. And we're proud to continue that uh, to this present day and into the future. We work also collaboratively with our partners within the industry on schemes such as Quinjack which enable to produce best practice to help support the industry in, in developing health and safety guidance for people to ensure that uh, they go home safe at the end of the day. So could you just take us back to some of the changes you've seen throughout your working career in the quarrying industry in terms of health and safety? Uh, so I think the biggest change for our industry is that a, um, for a, we were consciously unsafe, probably up to the 2000s. And then really from 2000 onwards, we've actually seen this move and recognition that actually we've, we've moved from being consciously unsafe to consciously safe. And I think that's the, that's the really biggest change. Our challenge is now to get ourselves to be unconsciously safe. And it is a challenge. And, you know, and I think if you look at the lagging indicators we've got now, that is indicating that we are still in that stage. But, you know, the, the, the great thing about our industry and the, the improvements we've seen is that a, uh, and, and a lot of us as, as a, uh, uh, more mature leaders as we are now is, is, is that we were unconsciously unsafe. And actually, when you actually recognise that, you can actually understand where you've come from. Where do you believe the greatest advances have been made? I think the comes back down to conditions. I think actually, and, and, and some of that has actually come from continuous improvement as well, is a, and the tools that the continuous improvement have given us. But I think we have improved our, our safe working environment. Um, that is not only in the hall roads and the edge protection we see around here, but I think it's in the, the mobile plant. Uh, um, you know, the, I remember the old days of a, uh, drum brakes that you used to have to drive into the, uh, into the stop piles to stop them. You know, the, the, the quality of, a, um, of, of equipment has improved. And, I think that, and, and if you actually look now when you actually come onto a site, everybody reverses parks you've got good pedestrian walkways. And I think that has probably made one of the biggest advancements that we've got is that we've actually improved our working environment. 
the area where there is there's still potential and uh, um, is actually in the mindsets and the behaviours of, of uh, and uh, um, and that actually comes down to the leadership and uh, um, and and actually taking people with you. So if you were defending a company following a, an incident that potentially had serious harm associated with it, what sort of evidence would you be asking them for first to produce in terms of the defence? Well, one of the things that I'd want to see uh, first of all is uh, some form of solid evidence that uh, they had been both aware of uh, and complying with their duties under the relevant statutory provisions. So I'd expect to see extensive documentation uh, that would uh, comprise the fundamental documents that would demonstrate to me uh, that, uh, that they were not simply disregarding the legal requirements. Um, for example, in a uh, quarrying scenario, it would very much depend on the incident, of course, but um, almost in respect of every incident, I would expect to see uh, a well-organised health and safety document, um, which is a requirement under Regulation 7 of the Quarries Regulations. I would expect to see that as a minimum, but I would then expect to see uh, documentation to show that they were aware of their duties and actually implementing them, observing them, checking and monitoring them. For example, under Part 5, I might be looking at an explosive case, that's Part 5 of the Quarrying Regulations, or, or under Part 6, Excavations and Tips Rules. So there is a wealth of corroborative evidence in the form of documentation that I would expect to see. But very importantly, I'd also need the witness evidence, without which I wouldn't know that what's in the paperwork uh, is, is being put into practice or not. So when you're looking at the witness uh, evidence, is that to collaborate the communication of those safety procedures and the health and safety document? It's to show me that a potentially very large chasm between what's written down and what actually goes on has been bridged. Are there common issues and areas within an organisation's health and safety policies and procedures that make it more likely that there's a case to prosecute? No, not really. Um, we, we don't prosecute any, uh, uh, any body or organisation for not following their own procedures. Um, it's, it's more likely if, if there are things missing from there that um, uh, we would expect to, to see in, uh, in there that we would, you know, do, would lead to, to a prosecution. But um, no, it, it's, a, it's a misconception that if you don't follow your own procedures, you're, you're uh, likely to be prosecuted for, uh, for that. You're prosecuted for a breach of law. Now, the, the two are linked, obviously, because people devise procedures in order to comply with, uh, with the, the law. But, Ultimately, you know, that any prosecution is founded on the, on the fact that they've not complied with uh, with the law. So I think it's what's missing from there generally, that rather than what's in there, um, that uh, creates the, the 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 breach, if uh, if you like. You know, we, we do take a, a lot of prosecutions on the basis that uh, risk assessments were inadequate. Someone has just not been cited on the uh, on the risk um, or. Uh, has identified the risk, but taken completely inadequate um, precautions. Uh, so that, that's that's a, a fairly common one. Yeah. Are there some general learning points that we can take from successful prosecutions that would allow others to learn from and avoid being in a similar position? There's very few uh, accidents, in my experience, um, occur because of one failing. The, in the classic cycle um, of managing health and safety, we think in terms of plan, do, check, act. Uh, if, 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 if it's wrong in any one of those areas, then people are open to, uh, to having accidents on the, uh, the site. But I mean, what I'm um, finding more and more is that the, the actual planning and the implementation um, generally has been done. What, what is not happening is the, the monitoring and the, the checking to make sure that that first bit is sustained uh, and can be sustained. And uh, there's not enough challenge in, uh, in my view, um, either from 
senior managers in some cases or by site managers and, uh, and supervisors who understand procedure, um, know what established procedure is, but, but don't uh, check or don't, uh, don't challenge. So what benefit do you think um, accreditation schemes like the sorts of ISO 45001 can offer organisations in demonstrating their ability to manage health and safety? Systems such as ISO 45001 can be really important for organisations. They provide a structured approach to enable people to implement a, a solid health and safety system in a, in a way that can be managed and checked and monitored uh, that allows organisations to be able to keep on top of their uh, regulatory compliance and ensure that they're managing the uh, system in an appropriate way. Uh, it allows a consistent approach in that, which is really important. Uh, quite often without such a structure, what you might have is a series of, of well-meaning uh, processes and, and policies, but they aren't brought together in a structured manner, which can be part of a problem in its own right. So just to go back to some basics on fundamental management of health and safety, plan, do, check, act. So it was brought to our attention the other day that perhaps we're not as good at check as an industry as we could be. What do you think, is that active supervision or is there another gap? I, th I think it's actually a responsibility that has to be embedded in everybody's objectives from the MD downwards. You know that uh, um, if, you if you go back to quality assurance again, it's called process confirmation. And, uh, and I think that you actually have to go back and actually um, do the check because actually there's lots of other opportunities from the check because it gives you an opportunity to praise. It gives you an opportunity to coach. So actually if you're not doing the check, I think you're losing the opportunity to improve your business. I guess that's one of the opportunities we maybe don't capitalise on is, is re positive reinforcement of good opportunities. Absolutely, I think there's sort of two things to it in the sense that it's, it's People quite often again look to the negative side of the plan, do, check, act element of it, but it, it's designed there to help improve things and take things forward. So you see it as an opportunity to improve, then I think it's really beneficial. And I think the second part is actually that it's not just about necessarily the check, you could broaden it out to the act as well. So again, where you quite often you see issues, the check may have taken place, but perhaps the, an act hasn't come out of the back of it. So from a workforce point of view, you might have raised an issue through a check, sort of identified there's an issue that needs to be resolved, but if constantly there's no action taken to resolve that point that's been raised through a check, that, that then that creates a negative culture within the organisation as well. So again, you know, it's, it's a, seeing the totality of it all and making sure that if you do identify something, there is a route that it is actually managed and, and, and changed as part of that process is really important. Otherwise you lose the worker confidence and again I think that takes you back to the start. So employees clearly have a massive uh, part to play within all health and safety systems. And within the quarry regulations, we have specifically mentioned competent persons. Could you, could you clarify or help us to define some of those competencies? Yeah, I mean, there is, in fairness, uh, a significant reference to it in the approved code of practice, uh, to the quarry's regulations as well. But what's very important to understand in health and safety law generally, and simply not just in quarries, is that competence is a combination of a lot of different factors depending on the circumstances. Um, simply because somebody has been trained does not necessarily make them competent to do a task. But equally, if they haven't had that training, the odds are it may make them less than competent to do it. So there are a variety of things that all come together and training and instruction um, govern uh, competence, uh, as do things such as experience, in some cases qualifications, and we mustn't forget aptitude, which is a very important part uh, of the competence equation. Uh, and significantly, a, a great many employers uh, fail to understand a very simple principle, which is even if they believe that somebody is entirely competent to do the task required of them safely, that if there is evidence, quite clear evidence, that they are not doing the job correctly, that they're not doing tasks safely, then that raises a big question about their competence and that needs to be investigated. But it's an amalgam uh, of uh, a great many things and of course it has to be assessed against the nature of the task that the people are being required to do. 
So the competence of individuals is mentioned in, in the Quarries Reg specifically, yeah. but other legislation as well. Um, what does the HSE look for in terms of determining whether someone is competent? There's many factors, as, uh, as you'll appreciate. Um, the, um, the underpinning knowledge uh, is, is obviously crucial that, uh, that comes from training, but that's not an end point because then you, you build on that with, uh, with experience and those other qualities. Um, you know, for, for example, leadership is, uh, is one of those uh, qualities that is essential if you're, if you're in a role of um, leading or, or managing uh, people. So um, the, the, the sort of fundamental yardstick in terms of um, the, uh, the competence is can they or can an individual demonstrate that they, they uh, match the, the requirements of the national occupational standard? We, that's what the, the, sort of the, the benchmark that, uh, that we chose because they're well described. Um, industries had an opportunity to, uh, to contribute into the, um, the preparation of those national occupational standards. So um, they exist. A number of uh, um, organisations have, uh, have mapped across from those na national occupational standards into well recognised qualifications. So there's, there's a route there uh, at, at least to start people down the, the route to, uh, to competence and then you look at the, uh, the other qualities for, for that people. But it, it, doesn't, it doesn't just exist in, um, uh, in, a, in a simple state like that because you've got to look at what is actually hurt, um, happening on the, the site at any one time as well and the activities that are taking place on the, uh, the site and is that individual competent to, uh, to manage um, everything that's happening on, uh, on the site at that, uh, at that particular time. Um, and in addition to that, do they recognise what their limits of competence are uh, and know when to, to say, no, I'm not competent to deal with, uh, with this situation and feel confident to, to say, no, um, and I'll, I'm not going to learn on the, uh, the job, that's, uh, that's the wrong thing to do, it's far too risky. Uh, I, need, um, or, you know, I need additional competence to, to do this or stop the job until uh, uh, we can work out what is, uh, is required here. So um, we'll, we'll start, uh, as I say, we'll start with qualifications. We'll look at uh, CPD and there's a number of uh, registered schemes that people can, uh, uh, can go on to, to record. CPD. Um, it, it soon becomes apparent by people's manner and demeanour uh, and what they've got to, to, to back up um, in, in terms of qualifications, whether they're competent or not to, uh, to run that site. Within the quarry regs, again, it mentions competence. And the competence of individuals has to be key to developing a good safety culture. How can we demonstrate and how can we improve the, co the competence of our workforce? And I think that's one of the core things for the Institute of Quarrying. As a, as a professional membership body for individuals, uh, we're all about developing capability and competence and being able to show that through our membership grade. So TMIQ, MIQ, FIQ are there to show that you've had an appropriate level of training, uh, developed your skills and knowledge over a period of time, and you're maintaining that through continuous professional development. So you're attending branch events, technical evenings, other activities such as conferences to make sure that you're continually keeping your skills and your knowledge up to speed. So as a member of the Institute of Quarry, what tools can I access to help me to benefit health and safety within my organisation? There's a vast array of tools that the Institute uh, provide to help and support members and their organisations. So if you go back to our basic membership uh, support tools, you have uh, access to webinars, fact sheets, we have our health and safety book, we have uh, training courses that are available for members, all the things you'd expect from a professional membership body. So in your experience, Alan, following a serious incident, is it always the systems and procedures or are there other elements that may have caused uh, impact and been significant root causes? The reality is that uh, there are a, often a host of factors uh, that have all come about at once uh, to uh, result in the incident itself. Now, systems and procedures um, not being properly devised, not being followed, can be uh, a particular issue. Um, but also, 
very noticeable in many cases that I've dealt with uh, are a host of other what you might even call human uh, and similar factors. Uh, and really that, that is where uh, the issue is potentially quite complex um, because the systems and procedures are one thing uh, but not only the way in which they are implemented but the way in which they're observed uh, is uh, a significant factor. Uh, and one of the things that I notice time and time again is that uh, organisations with on the face of it potentially decent systems and procedures uh, have actually got a fairly large compliance gap um, because, for example, those procedures are not being followed uh, and they're either not monitoring the situation sufficiently to spot that in the first place uh, or they're condoning practices which are non-compliant with the systems and procedures. And of course if the systems and procedures are in line with the legal requirements, non-compliance with those effectively means that there's legal non-compliance as well. So yes, there's very much more to it than simple focus on the systems and procedures. A massive element around behavioural safety and human factors under, underlying those issues. Absolutely. So one of the regulations that's come up a lot over the last couple of years is Reg 40 mm. uh, to do with workforce engagement. I, how do you find that when you're out inspecting? What do you look for? What would your inspectors be looking for when they're on inspection? Yeah. Um, I think what we're looking for um, is compliance with Regulation 40 in principle. Um, because engaging with the, the workforce and how you do that is, is, can be so um, variable across uh, sites depending on the, um, the size of the, the site, um, you know, whether that site is unionised, whether it's got um, uh, union appointed safety reps or whether it's got uh, you know, safety reps that have been appointed by the, uh, the company. Um, there's a lot of uh, variables and there's no one right way of, uh, of doing it but I think what we can all agree on is that if people engage with the, the workforce um, and, and take on board their, their ideas, their observations um, and implement them or whether they're not going to implement them, they feed back why, why not um, or you know, develop the, the idea and, and to it, to you know, create a, an alternative uh, solution, it's one of the topics that we routinely ask about on uh, on site. But we don't just ask the manager. Um, uh, we will ask the manager, but then we'll go and test it against the um, the workforce. So, so um, you know what we've been told. We'll we'll go and verify that. You know, are people aware that there's health and safety committees? You know, where are, where are the minutes? Um, you know, what was discussed at the uh, the last um, health and safety meeting on uh, on site, for example? Sounds simple, doesn't it? Good open communication with the workforce and encouraging engagement. I th I think so, and you know, in any workforce, there'll be those that don't want to uh, to engage. Um, there'll be those that do, and there'll be those that are sat on the uh, the fence. Well, you know, um, the twenty percent that don't, you you know, you're probably never going to bring uh, bring them in. But you know, if you can bring the forty percent that are sat on the fence in and see that uh, actually health and safety is a good thing, and it's not being done to them, uh, they're engaged and they are involved. Um, that's, that's a win. Within the Quarry Regs 1999, we have Regulation 40, which talks about workforce engagement. How do you think we could benefit from that regulation to really enforce that engagement and cooperation in the workforce? Quite often what you see where uh, we have incidents or issues or where systems don't work particularly well, it's where people aren't engaged in the process. You tend to find the most effective uh, health and safety systems are usually where they're in developed through the engagement of the workforce and they have a say in how they're implemented within their day-to-day -day working processes. They're embedded in, in what they do and they understand why they're there and they have a, a way of feeding into that to make sure that they're practical and pragmatic for the jobs that they do. How do you think a site manager can help to support their team in terms of driving safety improvements forward? The most important thing is actually that you sell the purpose so people actually understand why and how it how it fits in and uh, um, and so, some of that is actually you can do that through your, your safety committee meetings um, and selling the purpose so they can actually sell it out on site 
but it, it's actually thinking about rather than actually we've got to implement this um, and, and not explain why we're implementing it, you'll end up with just actually installing it and you won't get the buy-in. So that selling the purpose to the right people is so important. I think the other part of that is going back to it's giving people the skills and capability. So it's not just about the technical skills, but it's those, it's those softer skills is critically yeah. important in this because, because the messages aren't necessarily changing. The core issues aren't changing, but it's actually developing the ability to be able to engage people, understand, listen, and, and actually break that down to, to how do you reach different types of people in different ways. They all, we all respond in different ways to messages. So having a, a, a greater level of skill around that and a capability to do that is, is really important especially when you start to get towards the margins of, 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 of changing this you know you it, putting systems and, and other things in place you can make big significant changes early on I think what we've seen in the industry over the last 20 years has made some very big gains in its health and safety improvement and, and now when you get to sort of, towards the sort of target zero ambition when you get to those smaller percentages you, you've really got to fight hard to make the difference and it's, it's these kinds of things that will make that kind of that difference in, 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 in achieving that ambition so it's, uh, it's really important. Just expand a little bit on the culture and leadership in organisations and how that might affect their safety culture and how that might affect their performance in terms of safety ability. Well again I think this is where you can potentially cause a very very big gap um, between having on the face of it decent systems and procedures, compliant systems, uh, and what actually goes on in the workplace. Um, a poor health and safety culture uh, and poor or indifferent leadership uh, is counterintuitive to compliance because what it does is it, it, it creates the very scenario in which the systems and procedures are not followed or become uh, less uh, effective and unfortunately it's progressive so the effects of that can increase exponentially as long as um, the culture and leadership uh, isn't right. Uh, having said that, um, getting the right culture and uh, having the right leadership qualities is an art in itself. Uh, and a lot of organisations feel that they have good culture and good leadership and yet would be very, very surprised uh, to hear from experts in those factors that actually they're missing uh, the relevant compliance bars with that as well. So there's a, there is a definite art. Uh, to getting that right and it's vitally important um, because without it uh, things are not going to be done in the correct way and things are not going to be done safely. So in terms of operational managers, what do you think keeps site managers awake at night? Well, I, I, w I, would, I would like to think that uh, uh, there aren't many that are awake at night but I know that I've actually been awake at night as an operational manager in the past and uh, if, you, if I reflect back on that, it's usually because actually we've put them in situations that they actually haven't had the competencies to do. And I think that uh, um, the thing is, is that what we'd like to do is feel that you've actually got a just culture, that if they're actually feeling that they are not being able to sleep at night, that they can actually come and talk to their, their, their line managers to understand why they feel they're in, they're in that situation. Uh, but the roles nowadays uh, it are very complex. That a, um, if I go back to the days when I was a quarry manager, they're far, far more complex. The, our customers are more demanding. Uh, the leg legislation is, has, has changed. And so I can understand why they may feel that concern, but please, please, that a, it's got to be shared as well. So I guess it's a, it's a team operation, the supervisors on site, the manager, as well as the production manager or area manager and the support functions around it. Yes, it, it is very much a team effort and, uh, um, and, and when we actually promote people into roles we've got to actually understand that we've, we've got to support them in, in those roles um, and, and, and I think that uh, um, all of us if we actually look in the past We've actually, um, we have actually put people into roles because they were a good loading shore driver or whether they were a, a good crusher operator or a good asphalt mixer man, when actually we probably in the past haven't given them the right training. And I think that's where the great opportunity is, is now, is that we're recognising what competency is 
and the training that is available, you know, especially from the Institute of Corian as well. What do you think are the greatest challenges for operators trying to make sites safe for everyone, so employees, visitors and contractors? I think it, uh, the, the challenge is, is, um, is to make sure that you have a safe environment. One of the key foundations, I, I see safety as a, as, as a house and you have to have very good foundations before you, you build the, the rest of the house above it. And uh, I think that um, one of those big foundations is making sure you have a safe environment. If you look around the site today, we are at Baladon, you see good edge protection, good haul roads. Um, it's very difficult to actually have a safe site if your environment is not safe in the first place. Communication, culture, competence, they all seem to work hand in hand. They all seem to be contributory to each other. Is that a fair statement? Absolutely, yes. Um, I don't think one uh, one exists without uh, w without the other. Um, unless you've got that communication, you can't check your uh, your culture. You need to be uh, you know confirming that. Uh, People have got a good understanding of uh, of that all of the time, and the only way you can do that is uh, by talking to by talking to people, by communicating with uh, with people, and going out and talking to them, you know, on their terms, and going and meeting them, doing their work, uh, and uh, finding out what they're doing, how they're doing it, how they feel about their uh, their work. I think often one of the failings in the good and effective management of health and safety. And by the way, this is a view of Alan Milband. I'm not trying to suggest that this is the view uh, of anyone else, but I hope it's thought provoking, is there is a tendency far too often to judge health and safety, performance, compliance and the like from your own position and failing to put yourself in the shoes of other people. Can you tell us a bit more about what's actually covered within the book? Yes, it, it, it begins with a little bit of an introduction in the form of almost the history of uh, health and safety, uh, how it emerged and grew uh, into the quarrying sector. Uh, and then uh, it deals with the general law, if, in essence provisions under the Health and Safety at Work Act, uh, before it moves on to uh, a fairly um, uh, incisive commentary uh, on the quarries regulations with reference to the approved code of practice. Uh, but the, quarry, the quarries regulations don't exist in isolation. There are a whole wealth of other regulations that apply uh, in quarries uh, and by no means are all of them displaced by the existence of the quarries regulations. And it's absolutely uh, vital to know about those. Uh, and those are included as well. Uh, and against all of that background are, are Eric Darlow's original practical uh, observations, uh, which set it apart from your classic textbook. One thing that I've added, because I think it was important to do so in the modern age, is a chapter on enforcement which wasn't there previously, but it explains what the safety author uh, enforcing authorities, particularly the health and safety executive inquiries, uh, can do if they find that the statutory provisions are not being complied with. And I felt that that was particularly useful. So I've just spoken to Alan about the rewrite of the Institute of Quarian uh, law book. Um, it's obviously been extensively rewritten, edited and updated to make it current. Do you think that's something that we should welcome as an industry and look forward to? Absolutely, yes. Um, any resource that demystifies health and safety or makes it uh, easier for someone to uh, pick something up off the, uh, the shelf, read it, understand it, implement it and do something different um, has, has got to be, uh, to be a good thing. And it all relates back to the, uh, the quarries regulations. And when you think about it, you know, every one of those regulations was, was written because either someone's been crushed, broken, burnt, run over, you name it. Um, they, they weren't written by uh, you know, a, a bureaucrat in, uh, in isolation. They, they've, they've come about over uh, a long period of, of time because of uh, uh, the, the journey that the industry has, uh, has been on. Um, so any 
any form of guidance that, uh, that helps people understand the law and more importantly comply with the law and, and understand uh, their duty and, and what good looks like. Um, it's great. You've recently taken on the role of chair for Quinjack. Could you just tell us a little bit about what Quinjack is and why it's there and what it offers to the industry? The, the chair of uh, Quinjack is, um, is a great honour for me because I've actually been involved with, with Quinjack for, for 14 years um, when I was a, um, a, the chair of the geotechnical uh, sub, subcommittee. The thing that I, that I think is the great strength of Quinjack is the tripartite. The fact that it's uh, trade associations, it's the unions, and and uh, and the industry, um, and what you, you you can do is is that you can have frank, honest discussions with the HSE, you can have frank, honest discussions with the unions, and what you can actually do is take away some of the ambiguity that you have actually in the regulations, which then actually can produce guidance notes, which can actually help the um, people with the implementation of, of, of legislation and, uh, and how it was actually, uh, it can be introduced in practice. But also I think as he, in Quinjack evolves, I think Quinjack can be a really good way of actually producing um, good practice. And uh, the Quinjack brand is actually saying that it's got the, the agreement between those three parties and, uh, and people see that as the primary source of good practice and guidance for the industry. We spent time talking to legal and regulatory authorities within the industry to talk about the framework that quarry and operators work within. We've considered how this affects organisations and how it affects the culture and leadership in delivering health and safety benefits within those organisations. But what about the reality of embedding health and safety systems at site level? Do we give site management teams the right tools and equipment to embed corporate policies on their own sites? Do we empower individuals to deliver safety at all operational responsibilities and deliver health and safety benefits throughout their operations? How well does your organisation engage with your employees and workforce on health and safety matters? We are keen to keep this conversation going, so join us on the Institute of Quarians company LinkedIn page and use the hashtag IQON.